Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and good afternoon, everyone in person and also here on Zoom. Thanks for joining in. And so I think Stephanie really set the stage on kind of what some of the, the main pillars of my research program are. And in particular today, I'm going to be focusing on how environmental change has really influenced population ecology of freshwater fishes and also how this makes conservation really challenging as well. So freshwater ecosystems are some of the most threatened habitats relative to terrestrial and marine environments and have undergone a precipitous decline in recent decades relative to these other two types of habitats. And this is in part because freshwater are subject to incredible amounts of habitat loss and degradation in part due to anthropogenic alterations as well as climate change has resulted in our stream ecosystems becoming increasingly degraded and fragmented. In the case of many of these threats, some of these threats are in fact accelerating, particularly in the form of climate change. And data has shown that precipitation and temperature patterns are shifting away from historical baselines. And those of us in the American Southwest, and particularly in California, are very familiar with the impacts of drought and in fires here in the Southwest. And there's predictions that there will be an increase in these extreme events over time. And so some of the, the questions that I am really interested in is how will this impact stream fish ecology? And so today I'm gonna to go over three different studies over the course of my dissertation work at Colorado State and Clemson University, as well as two of my postdoc projects that I have been involved with here at UC Berkeley. So first, um, for my dissertation, how does the abiotic environment influence population trends over time for fish in the southeast? Then we're going to take a look at the California drought from the 2014 drought year. How has that drought impacted flow phenology mismatches of salmonids? And finally, I aim to end on a hopefully hopeful note on how we can mitigate these declines with a novel tool known as genetic rescue. Can everyone still see if that's, I don't know if I can. It's not on my computer. What do you need to know? Sorry, hang on. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Okay, now we're good. Okay, so in a time of global change, identifying patterns of demographic variation is important to predicting population level impacts. And demographic variation can be measured in terms of the amount of correlation in population trends over time, and which can be considered as either synchronous dynamics or asynchronous dynamics. So basically both sides of the, the same coin. Um, and this can be measured on any type of demographic parameter, whether it's abundance, survival. And these trends, so here's an example of very asynchronous trends over time. And in literature, this can be examined among three different populations or among three different or multiple different species. And inferences about the degree of correlation in a system can help inform the impacts of environmental change, changes in community structure, as well as inform extinction risk. And these synchrony patterns can arise in many ways. Climate can synchronize populations over broad spatial extents if they're impacted by similar climatic drivers. Trophic structure is another really classic example. Predator-prey dynamics, such as the hair, sushi hair, and lynx, are also competitors that are really cyclic over time, as well as similar species characteristics can lead to synchrony, such as synchronous dynamics and similar life history traits that are correlated with the environment or high amounts of dispersal among populations. However, synchrony patterns can also be disrupted where you have a lot of biocomplexity or heterogeneity in your system. So let's take, for example, you might have a similar climate or weather patterns over a broad region, but in your local habitat, there might be a lot of fine scale local habitat variation that interacts with climate to have very different abiotic environments across a stream watershed. Salmonids is a good example of those that are kind of impacted by, by these heterogeneity. They're clued in during spawning season to temperature and flow conditions, which can vary across 
the watershed, which leads to asynchronous timing and reproduction and can also give rise to asynchrony and population trends over time. Conversely, if you have a number of high species diversity or high diversity in species traits, this can also disrupt synchrony patterns and give rise to asynchrony. And so typically spatial synchrony among multiple populations of the same species is typically what's the most studied in the literature. But models that account for both sympatric within a community among species and spatial among sites within the same model are rare. So as part of my PhD, I set out to investigate environmental drivers of sympatric versus spatial synchrony using two stream fish communities in the southeastern United States in Clemson University, where I, I started my PhD work. And we conducted a bi-monthly marker capture survey from November 2015 up through March 2018, where we tagged and resampled fish over these two plus years in two streams, Indian Creek on the left and Todd Creek highlighted on the right. And these are two streams that are similar in size and located within the same watershed with Indian Creek here up in this top well forested picture and then Todd Creek on the bottom picture which has less riparian canopy cover due to be located within a power line corridor. Within these two streams, we tagged three different species. I have two North American minnow species within the Lucicidae family, bluehead chub and creek chub, and a sucker species, the striped jump rock. All three of these species can be classified as having cool water thermal, summer thermal requirements. They all inhabit small to medium rivers and also have overlapping and reproductive timing. And we can make some predictions about the magnitude of sympatric versus spatial synchrony within these two streams. Potentially, all species within the community are synchronized as well as across both sites. And then other potential patterns can be varying the amounts of synchrony and asynchrony. And so given that these two sites are, were pretty close together, we predicted that they would probably have higher spatial synchrony. And then depending on the importance of species characteristics, if species characteristics were important to population dynamics, we would be closer to, to scenario one, where there'd be high among species and among site synchrony, or if species characteristics was important, perhaps we would be have within community asynchrony, um, but synchronous across sites given their proximity. And to do to, to estimate the amount of synchrony, I conducted three sets of Cormac Jolly Seabird survival models within a Bayesian framework. First, estimating the environmental drivers of survival, and we measured mean water temperature and water level throughout the study, and also conducted additional models to model the magnitude of sympatric and spatial synchrony. And finally, depending on what that supported covariate was, we could then estimate what was the actual contribution to driving synchrony or asynchrony in the system. And for the sake of time, I'm gonna focus on the methods um, for the model for sympatric and spatial synchrony. So in estimating synchrony, I followed methods that are outlined in Lahoe's Montfort et al. 2011. And what's shown on the slide right here is the logit statement from the CGS model where I fit four random effects to characterize the temporal variance over time within these two systems. And each of these four random effects is characterized it has a, a mean and a variance. And what we're interested in are these variance terms on the bottom. So the first random effect just characterizes temporal variance. And then we start to index those variances by species, streams, or unique combinations of all streams and species. And the output from those various terms are then used to calculate an interclass correlation coefficient, which actually will then inform how much synchrony is in the system. So using this formula, if the value is closer to zero, a species is asynchronous with the rest of the community. And then if it's closer to one, it's considered synchronous within the rest of this community. So we're able to estimate six of these values, one for each species in each stream. And then with additional line of evidence, we also follow this up by just calculating Pearson's R correlations of the pairwise species subseasonal survival estimates. So first, let's take a look at how temperature impacts survival in the stream. So mean temperature was the most supported abiotic covariate in the system and negatively affected all species within both streams. And with some species being more negatively affected relative to others in, in Todd Creek, particularly Bluehead Chub and Creek Chub. 
when we take a look at estimating synchrony within and among these two streams, so just as a reminder, these are here is a table of the ICC values for species in both streams, asynchronous if the ICC is closer to zero and synchronous if it's closer to one. And what we found is that this, they range from about 0 0.5 or higher, indicating moderate to high synchrony in both streams. Todd Creek had an average ITC a little bit higher than Indian Creek, but there appears to be some sympatric synchrony among these species in both streams. We can plot out survival over time in both systems. The ICC values reveal perhaps a little bit more synchrony within the communities in Todd Creek relative to Indian. And one thing that we noticed when we were looking at subseasonal survival for each of these occasions is that there appeared to be this bottleneck period, particularly in Todd Creek within our first summer season, where survival really tanked down, likely due to, to summer water temperatures. As we saw previously, there's a, a pretty strong negative effect of temperature in both these streams. But what we can do next is we can do correlations between these posterior mean estimates of survival in both systems to kind of get other lines of evidence of synchrony or asynchrony. So we first examined sympatric synchrony using the Pearson's R correlation in both streams, where it's just pairwise, all the possible pairwise combinations. And we found kind of differing patterns between the two streams. So there was high sympatric synchrony in Todd relative to Indian Creek. So none of these in Indian Creek there was no significant correlations. Those Pearson R values were really low. And in Todd Creek, they were a lot higher, particularly Blue Head Chub and Creek Chub had an R correlation of 0 0.93. And all of these were statistically significant comparisons. We can then look at comparing the same species in both sites. So let's say Blue Head Chub and Indian Creek versus Blue Head Chub and Todd Creek. And these were all non-significant correlations and provided further evidence that there was asynchronous survival between these two sites. So what could be accounting for these spatial differences? So recall that Indian Creek, so while these are both very similar in size within the same watershed, Indian Creek, the major difference is that Indian Creek has a well-forested riparian canopy, and Todd Creek has more open located within the power line corridor. And we can examine temperature over time for these two streams, Indian Creek in blue and Todd Creek in red. And while for the majority of the study, both those streams track each other really well, where they start to diverge are in summertime. So specifically between May to September in both of these years. In 2016, summer temperatures were about two degrees warmer. And then in summer 2017, one to 1.5 degrees C warmer in Todd Creek. And while that doesn't seem too, too large of a difference, this really put these fish, particularly in Todd Creek, at their uppermost thermal limit. Um, recall it, this assemblage is a cool water species. And our additional analysis found that temperature really accounted for a lot of the variance and synchrony for, for these systems as well. So what we think is happening is that both these streams are ex ex um, experiencing the same weather conditions, but that forested canopy in Indian Creek is really providing buffering against that increased warming and in temperature relative to Todd Creek, which this power line corridor really follows right along uh, the stream. And so our synchrony patterns probably more closely followed scenario two, where we had somewhat moderate to high synchrony, maybe less so in, in Indian Creek relative to Todd, but there was a higher asynchronous dynamics between the two sites. And identifying these key environmental drivers of low survival is important for conservation. I mentioned before that these stressful events are occurring more frequently and they can increase in duration. And they have the potential, at least shown in, in this example, to synchronize whole species community and lower survival. And for particular species like these, which are very short-lived, if these become more frequent, they can be, start to have negative implications for their population dynamics. Accurately characterizing spatial heterogeneity as well has also have really important from implications for modern designs, accurately covering more sites to be able to characterize how dynamics could be impacting different communities differently. 
And so next we're gonna take a look at California and see how environmental drivers have been impacting fish species here as a result of the 2014 drought year. And so, as I mentioned before, there's been increases in extreme events such as drought and fires. Um, and I do want to pause for a moment that this is a study that's led by my supervisor, Stephanie Carlson. And when Stephanie gave an early version of this talk, uh, the a previous uh, Society of Freshwater Science meeting, that's where I actually first met Stephanie and we started talking about developing proposals and such. And so once I was brought on, I started diving through a lot of the data that, that we're gonna present today. So kind of full circle, we're almost ready to submit it. So, <laughs> uh, so California's 2014 drought year is one of the worst experienced in the region. And meteorological drought has really important consequences for aquatic habitats. So in, for those of you that are familiar or maybe not familiar with kind of our climate patterns, we're in a Mediterranean climate here in California. And so our rainy season occurs from about November up through May, although it feels like it's been getting truncated year after year. And the amount of rain that we get can be really variable. And we can see kind of this variation in patterns in our hydrograph. So this is a plot of discharge or the volume of water moving past the Pacific point over time. And the, the lighter gray regions are earlier historic years up through the 2011 water year. And 2012 to 2016 represents that kind of mega drought period. And so one of the consequences of this drought is we can see that in these darkened lines, the magnitude of those peak flows are a lot lower relative to historic years. It also can impact the timing of when our winter rains actually occur. So here I have those drought years taken out and in red highlighted is the, the timing of the winter storms for 2014, which arrived in February and much, much later relative to other years. For fish species, this is important because spawn timing is often cued in by abiotic variables like flow. And spawn timing can differ a lot among species. Chinook salmon, which has kind of a, a short spawning window between November and January. Coho, which takes advantage of winter rains December through February. And steelhead December up until early spring with the, the longest spawning window. So we asked this question, did the late storms in 2013-14 lead to a flow phenology mismatch? So since it was later than when their breeding window occurred, did this negatively impact these fish species? And we brought data together from a, a number of really fantastic long-term bonding programs that we have here in California for a few different rivers. And we asked two questions. So first, did late flows affect adult return timing to their spawning grounds? And two, if that is the case, what were the consequences of this late arrival to spawning grounds? So we'll first take a look at timing data from the Russian River, which is just a little bit north of us in Sonoma County, and then the South Fork Eel River farther up to the north and northern California. So in the Russian River, California Sea Grant, um, and also has been led by Mariska Obudzinski, who is a PhD student in our lab, has been running this really long-term monitoring program for nearly 20 years in the Russian River for the conservation of coho salmon. And they have a fantastic pit tag antenna array system, not only on the main stem Russian River, but also in these key four monitored watersheds. And so they have a really good idea of when coho arrive to the main stem and then when they distribute to tributaries to spawn. So in a typical year, they're detected on the main stem antennas around mid-October to early November. And then once the winter rains come, they reconnect these tributaries to the main stem, allowing fish to then move into the tributaries and spawn. And so they'll hold in the main stem and then a few weeks later be able to move into the tributaries triggered by those rain events. And so now we'll look at the, the 2014 year, how it overlaps with a typical year's data. And so gray, these gray density plots represent adult return timing for non-2013-14 drought year. And then the color density plots represent what happened in that winter. So in terms of when they arrived to the main stem, that distribution was pretty similar still. It overlapped with main stem. But if we take a look, 
at the, the tributaries, we see that it shifted far to the right. So coho weren't able to access these tributaries until nearly like greater than a month later of when they should have been accessing. And so they were just holding in the main stem until those late storms could reconnect and give them access to these tributary habitats. And Mariska's team got some pictures of the fish then they were able to actually make it into the stream. And so this is an adult spawning coho salmon. They're usually in pretty rough shape after they make their big journey, but they were in particularly bad shape after being stuck in the main stem. So we're gonna take a look a little later on how successful they were spawning in the system. If we take a look oops, at timing in the South Fork Eel River, which is a little bit farther to the north, we saw similar impacts in this system. Um, and we see kind of increasing overlap as we move to the right. So there's a little bit of variation of species like history traits coming into play here, where Chinook salmon, which has the shortest breeding window, but also the earliest, is shifted the farthest up and has no overlap with when they typically spawn. Coho salmon in the South Fork Eel River shows a similar pattern to the Russian River. And then steelhead was perhaps maybe the most minimally effective of these three species because they have this really wide breeding window. But you can tell it's still shifted up a few weeks. So we've seen that adult arrival to these tributaries was, was negatively impact. They couldn't access the habitats when at the same time that they usually do. So what were the consequences of these late arrival? And we have data from a number of different systems of production data, uh, spatial distribution within the river networks, juvenile counts, as well as adult spawner counts. And for the sake of time today, I'm only going to cover um, some data from a few of these systems. So if we take a look at coho salmon in the Russian River again, and these are juvenile count surveys throughout the watershed that they do each year. And we can compare an average over non-2013, 14 years to the drought year. And there was a contraction in the amount of habitat they were able to actually access in that drought winter, where a number of tributaries that used to have fish had zero or close to only a handful of juvenile individuals. So it's clear that this late timing had negative impacts on juvenile production. And so in combination of late adult ar ar arrivals, reduced spawning distribution, we have histograms um, or box plots here on the right of juvenile coho surveys, um, average kind of the distribution of counts across all non-drought years compared to 2013-14. And so some systems had complete cohort failure where there was detection of zero juveniles. And in other systems, maybe there some were detected, but there was far fewer than was typically found in this system. We can also take a look at a little bit farther to the north, the Mendocino coastal streams, where we examined adult coho surveys in these, these four rivers. Um, these are unique systems because they're known as intermittent estuaries. So here's a picture of the mouth of the Navarro River, which is one of the four we examined. And up here, we can see the sandbar that, that keeps the mouth of Navarro closed from the ocean. And when these fall storms arrive, they help bust that sandbar open so that the salmon can then come in and swim upstream to spawn. However, in the 2013-2014 year, that sandbar never opened. And so there was complete cohort failure because there were just zero adults detected in the system compared to when they're on a typical year can be upwards of hundreds of fish entering each of these four rivers in the Mendocino coastal rivers. So this 2013-2014 winter really stands out from other years because these storms arrived really, really late and resulted in this flow phenology mismatch. So adult salmon weren't able to access some of their typical breeding habitat, which led to cohort, cohort failure or low recruitment in some of these systems. This also has consequences, reduced carrying capacity when there's less available habitat for them to spawn in because there's not enough water. There's also altered spatial overlap. So if we kind of orient this um, South Fork eel plot a different way, typically it's staggered when each species arrives and spawns. But because of this delayed arrival, 
all of these are now spawning. They have synchronous dynamics and spawning, which can have its own problems if they're spawning, competing for spawning grounds if they have restricted habitat available to them. And drought conditions are likely to become more common in California. And so this type of issue might become more common in the future. And while Salmonids are really excellent at spreading risk across time and space through having different life stages in the ocean and fresh water, as well as multi-year cohorts, but repeated events, especially for short-lived species like coho salmon, which only have a three-year life cycle, repeated events like this could really keep them, um, have their population dynamics in trouble and reduce their actual buffering capacity and risk spreading across that temporal multi-year cohorts. But there's hope. So now that it hopefully bring you up a little bit, uh, recently we had a, a paper that was just accepted and came out in conservation letters where, so we're gonna revisit that Russian river, Coho Sabin, that is potentially in a little bit of trouble, where we examine the applications of genetic rescue to increase population fitness. So maybe perhaps try and give these species and populations a chance. And so all of these stressors that freshwater fish are facing, particularly in the West, has led to maybe to many small, sometimes isolated, but bottlenecked populations that have a number of demographic and genetic issues associated with being a small population. And so one tool that has emerged is genetic rescue. And what, in principle, genetic rescue increases genetic variation. So either you introduce additional variation by outcrossing or supplementing new individuals into a declining population, where you would hopefully increase genetic variation and subsequently see an increase in population fitness through this translocation of unrelated individuals. And while genetic is in the name, a lot of the evidence for a successful genetic rescue comes from demographic data. So with kind of weak evidence being an increase in genetic diversity, which you would expect if you're introducing additional individuals from increase in fitness metrics like survival and kind of some of the strongest evidence of increase in population growth rate over time. And, but it's not implemented, while it's known to be an important and valuable tool, there's a lot of hesitancy in implementing this tool, particularly for um, endangered and imperiled species. And this has to do a lot with balancing the trade-offs and risks between something known as inbreeding depression and outbreeding depression. So um, inbreeding depression, it's kind of the risk associated with being a small population. So here we have a kind of simulated data set with genetic diversity on the y-axis and the number of generations on the x-axis. And what this shows is that with a smaller effective population size, you lose genetic diversity more rapidly. And genetic diversity is considered, having higher amounts of genetic diversity is considered important because hopefully it'll give a population the diversity it needs to persist in the, the face of change. But conversely, while genetic rescue can alleviate these risks, factors such as outbreeding depression can actually lower fitness. There's concerns that fitness can be lowered due to having the introduction of this additional genetic variation can lower fitness by disrupting co-adapted gene complexes through the introduction of deleterious alleles uh, because the population might be locally adapted to this environment and be negatively impacted. And local adaptation is something that's really common in salmonids. Um, so here we have pictures of different morphologies across two for sockeye salmon for two really close sites. But the literature has shown that when you have a really small inbred population, genetic drift has kind of eroded away much of the signals of local adaptation. And a lot of the examples in the literature have shown there's really consistent benefits of gene flow when you have such an inbred declining population. And I have the opportunity to examine this further um, in a case study of coho salmon in the Russian River within the Central California Coast Evolutionary Significant Unit. So just kind of, we've talked about this program a little bit, but just kind of a, an overview uh, the Russian River is in Sonoma County, a little bit north to here in the Russian River. 
And they went through a severe population bottleneck in the early 2000s, where there was only a, have a handful of juveniles that were detected by the monitoring program. So they then pulled those juveniles into a captive breeding facility to try and propagate them and reintroduce them in the wild to try and boost adult returns over time. And then there started to be consistent adult returns beginning in 2010, 2011, and they've been pretty much consistently but up and down since then. And the, the Russian River Coho Captive Broodstock Program uses a number of strategies to try and increase adult returns. In the hatchery, there's really careful consideration of mate pairing and relatedness. And in the wild, there's a lot of consideration to different release groups, location, numbers, and the time of year that juveniles are released to try and give them their best shot at survival and making it out into the ocean. But there's really only so much ground to be gained when you're dealing with such a small bottleneck founding population. So in 2008, they looked to a coho salmon to the south, um, a Lima Creek in Lagunitas watershed about 30 miles south, to improve the genetics of the broodstock and hopefully bolster those returns. And so we conducted a retrospective analysis to ask the question, did outcrossing result in genetic rescue in the Russian River coho salmon population? And we investigated this using three different types of data. So we first looked at the genetics of the adult broodstock over time, where we predicted that post outcrossing, we should see relatedness decrease. We also examined fitness of their hybrid progeny in both the captive and, la and, the captive and, and wild environments, where we examined early life history as well as the proportion of deformities. And we predicted that hybrids should have higher early life history survival and lower evidence of deformities. And finally, um, back to that fantastic uh, monitoring program that, that Mariska has been managing, once they're post-release, we estimated in-stream survival and predicted that juvenile, hybrid juveniles should have higher survival relative to the, the pure Russian fish. And we also had some data um, to examine past the F1 or first generation hybrids, because sometimes negative effects of genetic rescue, you might see increased fitness in the F1 generation, but then there's lower fitness in subsequent generations. So we were able to examine fitness of F2 hybrids in both captive and wild settings. So let's first take a look at how adult broodstock relatedness changes over time. And so on the Y axis here, we have mean pairwise relatedness between any two given individuals that were used as broodstock. And then the X axis is the, the winter of spawning. So just as a reminder that all wild fish were used in 2003. So they had a really small, um, amount of individuals that were brought into the, the broodstock program. This was then pre-outbreeding. They tried to get this down as far as possible, which is why we see it declining initially. So they brought in wild fish from other streams when available. They also bred fish across cycles. So these different colored points represent since it's a three year um, life cycle, three potentially distinct lineages of coho salmon. So they would breed across cycles with precocious fish, those that matured at age two instead of age three. And then finally in 2008 with cohort number three here, they started outbreeding with Alima Creek fish. And so this first instance occurred from 2008 to 2010. And so we used a broken stick regression to identify if there was a shift in slopes in the data over time. And this identified 2011 as the break point in the data. And 2011 would have been the first time when hybrids of this 2008 outbreeding event would have been used in, into the broodstock. And so while it's declining in the early years based on their decisions, this causes a significant shift in the slope where it levels out because you're about at that plateau of how much relatedness you can actually decrease. So they're in really good shape now in terms of relatedness among individuals in the program. And so now let's take a look at what are the outcomes of their this improved broodstocks hybrid progeny. So we examined hatchery metrics from 2008 to 2000, 2019. And the first generation progeny can be one of three cross types a non-hybrid, which is a, both parents are from the Russian River, or two reciprocal crosses. 
A hybrid with a, in this first position is the female parent. So maybe the female parent's from Alima Creek and the male parent is from the Russian River. And then the reciprocal cross where the female parent is from the Russian River and the male parent is from Alima Creek. And we examined early life history survival metrics at three different stages, as well as the proportion of deformities. In model results revealed that F1 hybrids with a female Alima Creek parent signif were significantly different from the pure Russian River cross type. So hybrids with a female parent outcross parent had higher early life history survival. Um, these are significant effect sizes and they had significantly lower proportion of deformities. And there was no relationship between pure Russian river crosses and those with a male parent from Alima Creek. So some evidence potentially of a, a maternal effect at work. And next, once those individuals get around 60 millimeters in size, they receive a pit tag and they're released into one of four watersheds. And Mill Creek had the longest kind of data set to examine survival of these different crosses from 2009 to 2013. And then comparable arrays were installed in 2013. So we have one year where I will look at spatial differences in survival. And so we asked, does survival vary by cross type once they're released into the wild? And we had a data set for spring release for fish and fall release fish. They get released at different times of the year. Um, Spring release fish will spend an entire summer in the Russian River before out migrating, whereas fall release, they get released when they're a little bit older and they miss that summer period entirely, they try to give them a, a boost in, in survival. And then finally, a spatial analysis for those four sites in 2013. And I'm just gonna focus on one in three for today. So here's our output from our survival over time in Mill Creek. On the y-axis, we have our survival estimate and on the x-axis are our three crosses. And what we found is that similar to the, the captive results is that hybrids with an Alima Creek female parent had higher survival than both the reciprocal cross and pure Russian river fish. But we do see that the reciprocal hybrid cross with a, a male Alima Creek parrot is intermediate to the two. So there may still be some biological significance of that reciprocal cross, but the magnitude, the biggest difference is really when that parent, the female parent comes from Alima Creek. If we look across the four different streams, we still see similar patterns, but the magnitude of differences varied across space, potentially due to environmental differences. And so we saw less differences among cross types in periods of high survival, and also fewer differences in periods of low survival. And this could potentially be due to like when conditions are favorable for everyone, everyone's gonna have favorable survival. When conditions are really, really stressful, you're not gonna really see any benefit of that additional genetic variation. So if there's less variation in fitness, there's less opportunity for selection to occur. So overall, we saw that over time, relatedness decreased over time for the adult brood stock. We saw higher survival, less proportion of deformities in the captive environment, and also higher survival for those individuals that were released in the wild. And I won't go into the F2 generation results, but we also saw a similar pattern. So there wasn't evidence of outbreeding depression in later generations, because we saw either higher survival or the same survival relative to those pure Russian river fish. So did outcrossing actually result in genetic rescue? We saw that this increased genetic diversity in the population and also increased survival or a kind of a surrogate metric of fitness. But what about population growth over time? So here on the right hand side, we have that plot of adult returns to the Russian river over time. And the first kind of year we saw consistent gains was in 2010 and 2011, which coincides when those first wild hybrids would be returning to the Russian river watershed. Now these consistent returns can't be solely attributed to this outcrossing event, which has been sustained since 2008. Program monitoring protocols have changed over time. There's been differences in adult releases, but all the evidence so far points that it's probably had a positive impact on this endangered population. 
It's also important to note that demographic increases may not always be evident, particularly for endangered and imperiled species. So maybe you alleviate the genetic concerns, but if your environmental conditions or your habitat isn't up to par to allow that population to grow, you may not see that demographic benefit. Within the past year, there was um, an NPR story related to the, the Florida panther, which is kind of the, the poster example for successful genetic rescue. They increased the population to 200 plus cats, but they're losing upwards of 20 adult individuals a year due to road cross killings. And so for a population of that size, that's a pretty massive debt in that population each year. So yes, while improving the genetic risk is important, we also on the other side need to be thinking about those threats that got that population there in the first place. And along the lines of the Florida panther, Salmonids in California still have to contend with a lot of environmental variations such as drought and fires. So we need to make those, those habitats really resilient as well. And so with that, that's uh, the end of my presentation. Um, and lots of thanks to the number of university partners that I work with on this project, as well as state and federal agencies. Um, as, and special thanks to the, the Berkeley Freshwater Lab. This is a very outdated pre-pandemic photo. We need a new one. Um, as well as the Garza Lab down at UCSC and NOAA in the UC PPSP program that funded these, these first projects. And I'd be happy to take any questions from the audience. Thank you. Two yeah. Yeah. So because it's such a long-term monitoring program, the genetic data changed over time. So initially, it was microsatellite data, and then it transitioned to SNP data, and they're in the process of switching again to microhaplotypes for the just as the field advances. So relatedness is a metric that you compare, you can compare across years with, with different types of genetic data. Yeah. Oh yes, sorry about that. So the question was what types of genetic data was used in the genetic rescue project? Um, and so it was microhaps in the beginning, as well as then a transition to SNPs. And they had overlap for about three or four years where they, um, genotype with both just to make sure for like kind of quality control issues yeah and then the second question was in terms of the genetic rescue like is the environmental conditions of this work population pretty similar to where there would be transplants in the Russian river are you concerned about like a swapping of like local conditions in the Russian river like what we're long here yeah, so the question was, are the environmental conditions similar between the, the two habitats? So is there concern of swamping? Um, so the Alima Creek was chosen because it was perhaps like the best option in terms of similarity to the Russian River. It's definitely a more robust population relative to the Russian River. I think because inbreeding was so severe in that Russian River population, there's pretty low risk of that swapping occurring. Um, and there was really great research done by Sarah Fitzpatrick's lab that when you have such kind of like decrease in that genetic variation, that it's it's not likely that that, that swapping is going to occur. But yeah, that's definitely always a concern. What avenue do you take when there are these all these potential risks? Yes, Amy. Really good talk, Casey. I was wondering, like I said, technology mismatches. If there is any indication um, that uh, salmon that came out of the Mendocino trip that's juvenile and then the closed estuaries successfully strayed to other environments? Yeah. So the question was the impact. So the ones that were already there and potentially. So in the, can you repeat it? Yeah. So salmon that were attempting to return as adults in the Mendocino tributaries, if they, you know, met this closed estuary condition, would they come out for a while and successfully strayed to nearby? Uh, okay. I see. Yeah. That's a really good question. So Amy's question was, 
in the Mendocino coastal trips for the flow phenology section, when they were met with that closed sandbar, were they able to stray and enter um, different systems? And so I don't, I don't specifically know, but I, I don't know if conditions nearby were just so not. There were several, so the Mendocino, the data there can be contrary to fish and wildlife, they monitor my experience with the part of Mendocino coastal stream monitoring. The four that she showed are the ones where there was a sandbar in place for the whole winter, the others um, have an open estuary. And so what they, they don't know, I guess the short answer is they don't know, but they didn't see like an increase in the nearby system um, that you might expect if those fish straight to the um, But it's, it's a bit of an open question. Yeah. Yeah, so Stephanie followed. I don't know if folks on Zoom were able to hear, but so there's a number of other systems nearby that CDFW monitors that don't have a sandbar, so they have an open estuary. But while they don't know if individuals from other systems came in, they didn't see an increase in those adult returns. So it's still unclear if fish then try to find alternate places to enter and spawn. All right, well, thank you. Oh, you got one, Jesse. I'm curious if there are other mechanisms similar to the open up those habitats, water releases that can allow that. Oh, the, to open the estuary? Yeah, so the question was, are there mechanisms to, to actually help open the estuary? I think it's tricky because of the organisms that need that kind of specific, like maybe have physiological requirements within that estuary. If you don't have the flows to kind of combat the salinity influxes from the ocean, I, I don't think there's any upstream like dam that could do flow releases, or if there would even be enough water in a drought year to perhaps do that. But yeah, it's a good question, but I think the balancing of kind of those other species that use it, because it would be nice to bust it open and let them come in, but then it could cause a whole bunch of other problems as well. And the one that to say that there are several places where the, where the sandburns are manipulated um, and injected um, for example, and Pescadero was another one. And um, in that year, maybe doing that would have been able to help them open the upstream, but there's a whole host of other fishes that benefit from having the estuary closed, including species like tidal reptilia, which are another contender species that rely on that. So um, it's a very contentious system. Yeah, yeah. And so Stephanie just elaborated that there are subsystems where they do manually open the estuary where it's managed, but given the imperiled species that are in those Mendocino coastal rivers, they're unable to do in, in that system. Yeah, Rachel. In the just the example of for field crafts here, yeah. was there any alternations of Chinook and Coho and Zuna all spawning on top of one another and competition on the spawning grounds due to this synchronized timing? No? Yeah, so the question was, what were there observations in the South Fork Eel, given that they overlapped a lot in the South Fork Eel um, in terms of com competition for for spawning. So I believe South Fork Eel is one of, at least we have anecdotal, but not data evidence from, from the managers, but they were all kind of restricted in, in the main stem. Um, and so they were in really, really poor habitat considered of what was their typical spawning. So if they were able to actually spawn, you know, like how, how successful they would be in that system. But it was really hard for them to, to access that, that upstream more suitable habitat. Great, thank you everyone.